when I say father, what are the word associations that come to your mind? We'll put some up on the screen right now and see if you identify with any of them. Whether you're thinking of this as either fatherhood in general or whether you're thinking of this as your own father. On the first line are words like protector, provider, originator, authority. Second line is present, nurturer, loving, encourager. Maybe some of you are saying, yes, that's my father. That's the kind of father that I know, and here's the rest of the list. You missed this one and this one and this one. Maybe others of you are saying, that's my hope and my dream, but I've never seen that in fathers or fathering persons in my life. So what I want to say today about fathers is not necessarily our experience, and this could be said about mothers. This is not about mothers are good and fathers bad or fathers bad. I mean, fathers good and mothers are bad. This is just all of us in parenting roles come with some sort of blemishes and imperfections. And God as our father, God as our parent, God who embodies both the mothering and the fathering qualities is, is, uh, is uh, here for us today and wanting to be responding into our lives and to be giving us and pouring out into our lives the best that he has. So today on Father's Day, let's talk about fathers. Sometimes fathers carry guilt. Sometimes fathers feel guilty. Maybe it's because you say, when I was raising my children, I was not there as I wish I had been for there. Maybe I was absent. I walked out on my kids or maybe the kid's mother and took the kids and walked out on me. Maybe it's just because I was absent. I was trying to provide for my family and in the process, I got caught up in my career and working and earning and that became my goal rather than to be the provision and investment into our family. Or maybe I was there physically, but I was absent emotionally because I had so much happening in my own life that I was unable to really give myself to my children in the way that I wish I had, that I brought my own issues from my own family of origin that had things that were weighing me down, dysfunction, and I was medicating them with this or with that, or I was just escaping from whatever way. I had this toggle switch that either I was trying to be comfortable for myself or I was angry and full of rage. Some of you are just saying, I just am angry too often, that there's this stuff that's within me that's that's just sort of bubbles up and it comes out. And sometimes I regret to say that I take it out on people that are close to me, sometimes even my children. And I feel inadequate in different places in my life. And sometimes I feel that people are piling it onto me and then I come home and take it out at home. And I just want to say that whatever the measure you're using on yourself today is not the measure that God your Father is using on you. Because he welcomes you into his arms. He welcomes you with his loving kindness, with his care. He says, I'm a healer. I redeem. I restore. I reconcile. Your page is not written according to what your experiences have been. That's what Jesus does as he comes in. Don't try to come to my presence because of great success. Don't try to escape from my presence because of what you call failure. Because I'm here to welcome everybody to come before me as my children and allow me to minister into their lives as the father. Sometimes we grow up and because of fatherhood or motherhood and the way our parents treated us, we feel resentment. And so if we had rough relationships with our fathers, if they were abusive or in other ways that we carry resentment, even that I'm just making this comparison already, you're tempted to click out. And, and, and you're kind of resenting me for, for, uh, for just bringing it up and making this painful analogy again. Will you just hang on a minute? And let me say, you're feeling this lack and this discomfort and this disjuncture because hardwired into you is this awareness, this knowledge and this knowing deep down in your being that fatherhood is something precious, is something noble, is something right and good and something that we all need. 
And whenever that's disrupted, it, 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 uh, it allows a void to be there. And God, as our Father, is the only one that can come and fill that void. No matter what a spectacular father you have, there's certain ways that there's disappointment, that there's lack, and that there's a father gap in your life. And the father heart of God is coming into that moment today and saying, I am here to fill that gap. Because whatever that is that is prepared with, I mean, what, whatever that gap present within you, uh, it's, it's, it's there for me to fill, is what God is saying. He is there to be ministering into that void. And that's a great relief to us fathers to know that our effort is to lead people into the presence of God the Father for him to be the one who comes and supplies. We are replicas. We are examples. We are temporary to bring people into that connection with God. So, since God, as Father, was around first, let's allow him to be the template. Don't say, my Father was this, and so if God's a Father, therefore he must also be like this. Rather say, God, reveal your Father heart to me. Press into that. I'm grateful for my Father to give me life. I'm grateful for whatever else my father gave into me. And Father God, you take it, you fill in, you multiply, you take and increase into my life so that I'm becoming the person that you want me to be. So don't allow the enemy to pull you away from experiencing the father heart of God for you. The enemy will deceive you and will say, your father was this. That means that when God reveals himself as a father, that he, will, that he will fail you, that he will sometimes not be there. And that is just a lie. That's not the way that God will act with you. God comes and ministers to you in the way that he knows that you need it the best. His father imprint comes into our lives. What God has for us that's best for our lives is not always what feels easy at the moment because he's instructing us, he's caring for us, he's growing us, he's bringing us into spiritual and emotional adulthood. Just as our bodies come into physical adulthood, it's God our father that brings along our spirits and our emotions in that capacity. I'm sitting here in this CCF worship space, and I remember, I think, the first time that June and I and Lee and Austin came into this space in April 2008. We were living in Hong Kong. We were coming into uh, CCF and visiting. Uh, we, we knew that we would, would be moving back into this area. We were looking at houses, looking at schools, and we came here to church saying, we think this is the church that we want to join into, and we want to check it out. And so I'm looking at the spot where we were seated, over there on the, seated? Seated. Over there on the left-hand side, about two-thirds of the way back. And at that point in the life of CCF, fifth and sixth graders were called Club 56, and they joined in for the opening worship, and then they... They, uh, they are separated out for their class in, in, in the message period of the service. Austin was in fifth grade. So he was in this club fifth, fifth and sixth. And so as the announcement was made, club fifth and sixth, uh, go to your class. Austin looks at me with these pleading eyes that just said, Dad... Do I have to? Do I have to go? And I think he knew that my answer was going to be yes, you do have to go. But he was so tired of checking out schools and meeting with people that he didn't know. Even the gracious people that were hosting us still takes energy when you don't have relationship with them, right? And so his week had just been full of that. And here was dad just pushing him out, forcing him to go once more into a place where he didn't know people. 
What he may not have been aware of was how hard that was for me to tell him to go. Because there was nothing I wanted more than at that moment to just say, Austin, no, you just sit right here on me. You can even sit in my lap and I'll just hold you throughout the whole service. Because there was that emotion within me that just wanted to protect him and hold him because I was his dad. But what he needed was to take that step out. What he needed was to learn how to grow in this environment and to become, a, I mean, a, a person who started to emerge as a young man. So that and a hundred different times, our jobs as fathers is not the easy thing, but it's because we're entrusted with that ability to see longer range into what is in the best interest of our children. The word of God says that we train up our children in the way that they should go, not in the way that we went, not in the way that feels good for us as a moment, not that puts them as a hedge of protection around ourselves, but that is freeing and releasing and empowering and building into and taking those appropriate, age-appropriate steps to become the men and women of God that God intends for them to be. That's, I think, a father's heart. That's God's heart for us. That is gently taking us step by step. That's asking us always to be taking that step of faith into the unknown. His presence goes with us. But it's that step of faith that's just one more that puts us into that place where our roots of trust and understanding and who God is as a father, that he's the one that will never leave us or forsake us, that allows that to become real in our lives. In Ephesians chapter 3, in this letter that the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, he talks about and prays for us in in what it means to have God relating to all of us as a father. In verse 14, it starts like this. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth derives its name. That's one verse, but it's a lot. First of all, it says in verse 14, for this reason... So we have to go back in the verses before that and find out what the reason is. Just trust me to tell you. In verse 10, it says that God is making this church, these humans on this world, because through them, in many different ways, he wants to display his power, his glory, his greatness, his redemption in this world. And he doesn't just want it to see for other people in this world, but it is for the principalities and powers in the heavenly realm. Those Minions under Satan, the devil, who tried to do a coup against God. God says, I'm going to use you and me to show them what's really happening. I'm going to use you and me, God says, to be showing that my power upon this earth is more powerful and more redemptive than anything from the pit of hell that can be thrown against you. That's the testimony that our sister was sharing with us this morning. That's the reality of how God is about to transform lives. So that's the first thing. It's like, this is who I'm calling you to be as a church. That you, that, that the light is shining on you, not only for the physical around you, but for the spiritual as well, that displays my glory and my goodness to you. Then the second thing is to say, this was my purpose all along. It was never my intention, the, the, the way that God worked in the Old Testament through the Jewish people was, was to prove the new covenant, was to bring us to the place where Jesus would be the solution. It showed us the necessity of God himself coming and showing up in our midst. And because of this Jesus, it says in verse 13, 12 or 13, then that we can approach God in freedom and confidence. So here we are with this freedom and confident relationship with God, our Father, this Father who we can run up to and jump into his lap and call Daddy, who's king of the whole universe, unthreatened, no power on heaven or earth can can stop who he is 
in his reign and rule. And he says, We kneel before this Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. There's some translations that translate this part of the verse a little bit differently. And some focus in on the fact that God is a creator, that he creates all that there is. This translation especially links it to the fact that we get our name from who God is. The name is how we identify ourselves. You're talking on the phone. You say, hi, this is Glenn. Now, if it's a friend, they already know that because your name comes in on the cell phone, right? But, but, but it's like we identify ourselves by our name. And God the Father is saying, here is my name. And when we're given his name, it not only identifies us with him, but identifies him with us as well. God is putting himself on the line for you. And he is saying, you are my child and you are identified with me. Whatever you do, wherever you go, you belong to me and I will be your God. Even when we embarrass him, we're still his kids. We still belong to him. We still. So the family name gives our identity. Sometimes from a family name, you can tell different things. You can tell their ethnicity. You can tell their origin. Like my family name is Kaufman. Kaufman. Any guess what language that comes from? Kaufman in German means businessman. I remember being in Germany, and I don't understand German, but I was sitting in a meeting, and every once I'd hear them talk about Kaufman, and I'd get all nervous like they were going, like, like, like I had to say something. They were just talking about business people. So that's my origin. I came from Switzerland, from a German-speaking part of Switzerland in the canton of Bern. I mean, I say I do. It's like my great, 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 great grandparent came from that area. So a number of years ago, I was at a conference, a missions conference in Germany, and I caught up with, uh, with an acquaintance there. And, and so he was hosting me for a day or two, and he took me to his hometown in Germany, this rural town. His father was a farmer. We got there on Sunday morning just as the church was ending and the men and women were coming out of the church. And so the father of my friend comes over to me, husky guy, was a farmer, and he reaches out his hand to me, and I grasp his hand, and do you ever feel a farmer's hand? It's like thick, big, strong from milking cows and lifting hay bales and shoving pigs where they should be and where they, I mean, all that, you know, it's like the muscles goes into their fingertips and throughout their whole bodies, and he grabs that hand, and instantly I'm like, this feels like the hand of my former uncles. This feels familiar because this, this is part of this German identity, this ancestry. And then he says, Kaufman, welcome home. Because he knew that there was an identity, a connection, an affinity there. Maybe about the same time, in that same era of time, I was in the Philippines. And I was talking to a pastor who pastored a church in the big city of Manila. And at the time, I was doing regional mission work for EMM, and I was also pastoring a church in the big Asian city of Hong Kong. And so this Filipino pastor and I were standing up on their flat church roof, and we were discussing together how this was to be urban pastors in, this, in these great urban centers of Asia. Asia is full of people. And so the cities are huge and the problems are complex. And so we were up there and with Pastor Balukas and I, we didn't have that ethnic identity. But we were identifying together because we carried the name of our father. Because we carried the name of our Father God who had called and ordained us both to be leading various parts of his church. 
and I felt close to him because the Father had called us, had given us his name, and we both were sons of the Almighty God and called to be leading churches in the teeming urban centers of Asia. Our identity is meant to be rooted most deeply in who we are as children of God. So here we are, a church of all these different nations. The only problem is that there's still more that need to come. Please welcome them in among us, Lord. But here we are, these churches of different nations called to become a people of God, to identify together because he as the Father is calling and wooing us all as his children. Remember, earlier we said that your experience might not match the core of what we're saying. And so that's how come we can let the past go. Because we receive this identity that we belong to God. That's a choice that you make. God, use your power Use your identity, use your wooing to be calling my spirit, my heart, and be changing me so that my deepest identity is found in you as a daughter or a son of who you are. The prayer goes on. I pray that out of God's glorious riches, that he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. So this identity is not just something on the surface. It's not just about, it, it doesn't have anything to do with pigmentation of our skin. What it has to do, with what's planted here in our hearts, our identity in our inner being, because it's a place that is there that's being transformed. Our identity is there because, verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. And that we, being rooted and established in love, have power... Notice how we get this power. It's together with all of God's holy people. Your power from the Lord God, his resurrection power, is most mighty and strong in you when you are gathered in with the Lord's people. There's a synergism of that power that happens. That as we come together, as we minister together, as we meet together, we allow his transforming power to be coming through us in ways that would not otherwise be happening. And we discover how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. It's a love that surpasses knowledge. We can't explain it, but we want to be filled to that measure of all the fullness of God. Here's the promise. To him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. Let's hear that this morning. According to his power that is at work within us as a body of Capital Christian Fellowship. According to that, that's immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus from generation to generation. So then, fathers... What's our part? What's our part in this glorious plan of the ultimate father of all? Could I give a football analogy this morning? The Bible becomes the playbook. Every football player at the start of practice gets a book. And their job is to understand the plays that are in this book. So that when they get into the game, they don't have to describe every single bit, but that they just announce the play and everybody knows what their position is. So the playbook communicates true fatherhood, rooted in God and applied into our context. That's how we learn what our role is as a father. And that our job is not to but is to prove it and to call it into into, into, uh, into uh, being. That it's uh, rooted in God and applied into our context. The second point is that everybody on the team plays their role. 
Because I'm a father to different children than you're a father to. How you relate into your children is according to your script, your personality, and theirs, and mine as mine. So there's not like one way to do it absolutely right. But it is to see what's present in your children and to apply what's best from this playbook into their lives so that God is glorified. The third point is that in football, it's important to communicate in every way possible. They gather in a huddle and they communicate together. Then as they split out from their huddle and line up, there's somebody on the line that's communicating for the line, somebody in the backfield that's communicating for the backfield. There's the quarterback that's announcing the play and code so that his people know it and the opposers don't. All of them, let's say it this way. You communicate with your attitude. This is the triple A approach. You communicate with your attitude. Sometimes your attitude is speaking louder than anything else you do. So, <laughs> Leah, my daughter, who's here, here's your moment to get into the lesson this morning, okay? I would, uh, when Leah was a little kid, and, and, uh, and I remember this most, when I would be away on a trip, and I'd come back, and, uh, and, uh, and so it would be, you know, June and Austin and Leah, and we'd sort of all be gathered together just greeting each, each other. And whenever Leah wanted to say something to me and she felt that I was giving, you know, June too much attention or something like that, she'd just reach up and take my face and just move it so that I was looking at her. It's like, here, Daddy, look at me because I'm communicating with you right now. And I want your attention right now. So the attitude of my heart needs to be toward her. That's God's heart to every one of us, fully present with us. First one's attitude. The second part of our communication is in our actions. If our actions aren't ready to line up what we want to say, don't bother to use the words. Don't try to get your children to say, don't do it like daddy does, just do it this way instead. It's not going to have a lot of the impact. So when we teach our sons to respect women, it starts with us respecting our wife or respecting our son's mother. It, 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 that's that kind of respect, that kind of, of showing in action is how we communicate this Father heart of God. So attitude, action. The third one is audibles. Sometimes the play changes, and they call out an audible. And it's like, because of the circumstances, this is what you need to do. And everybody needs to be listening to the quarterback in the game of football. So the audible simply means use your words. I just wanted to get an A in there so we could have, have a, the triple A, okay? So... So, so we use our actions, we use our attitudes, and we use our words. Which means we don't try to use money to buy kids things to win their affections. Rather, we invest into them. We spend time with them. We hear what's important to them. Somebody said, how do you get your children to talk to you when, you're, when they're 14? You listen to them when they're four and you're paying attention, and you're allowing whatever's on their heart to be the most important thing to you at the time. I'm not making this up. It's how God treats us. It's how he relates to us. That true fatherhood on heaven and earth that derives its name comes through our godly fatherhood when we as fathers are saying, we open up our lives and our hearts to you. Please use us in this delightful role that you've called us to as being fathers in order to share your glory and your true fatherhood with all that are before us in our paths. Lord Jesus, will you use us in that kind of fatherhood way? Will you use us in being people that are led by your spirit, that are living under the authority of your fatherhood in Jesus' name? Amen.